chapter seven goes into networking and how networks get set up and then some of the issues related to networking so it is very connected to chapter six and chapter five um chapter seven really talks about the physical connections we talked a lot about the hot the the actual web itself the information that's housed on the internet chapter seven goes into how networks get set up so it's more the the components that you need to have to connect computers together in the first half of the chapter, they just kind of talk about all those technical components of a network. And then in the second half, it talks about some of the issues related to sharing information online. So the objectives for the first half of chapter seven are to be able to describe the different ways that networks get set up. Um, and then some of the different types of software and um, protections there are in case data gets lost or damaged while it's being transferred or copied from computer to computer. Um, so the definition of a network is basically a set of computers, hardware and software, and other types of media that are connected to connect computers together. Um, some of the benefits of networking, as you can see in this picture, you can have a lot of people using the same software. This is similar to what we have in our classroom in the computer lab. Users can share the data and programs. Um, and you notice there's no towers on the desks in this picture because they're all sharing probably the information from one server. So it eliminates the need to replicate systems. You can have one server where all the data and um, software is housed. It's easy to back up data because it's going to one central location, um, the server on the network. Um, and it allows you to communicate in a different way with people in your organization because you can create things like an intranet where um, it's limited to the people within your organization. And you can also communicate using a variety of different software programs when you're connected to a network. Different types of networks um, are really defined by who can use them and how far they are, the computers are from each other. So a local area network is one within a smaller geographical area. Um, and it can still have multiple devices, but usually they're close together within the same building or within the same couple of buildings. They're not separated by a large distance. A wide area network is a connection of two or more local area networks um, and they're usually separated by distance. And so the internet itself is an example of a wide area network. It's a whole bunch of different local area networks that are connected together via a variety of different connections. Um, and so some organizations that have several locations might be connected to each other via a wide area network. And that the two terms at the top, the local area and wide area networks, those are basically describing how many different systems are connected and how far apart they are. Intranet and extranet talks about who gets to use them. So an intranet is an internal network. So it's limited to the people within an organization. And usually you either have to be connected to their server or you have to have password access. So if you were, um, for example, our grading, um, database in the DOE is an intranet. Only people who have local access and can access the server can get into that software and that, um, that data. So that's an intranet. An extranet is one that shares information with people outside. So the web, most websites are all part of an extranet where organizations might put information out there for people outside to be able to view and access. Some of the different kinds of media or actual physical connections that you need to take um, one computer and connect it to another are referred to as network media. Um, and they basically link computers together. Um, a computer on a network is called a node. So every machine in our classroom is a node on our intranet. Different kinds of media that can connect computers together. Twisted pair cable is a traditional telephone wire, basically connects so some metal cables, they're twisted, and um, they transmit data. They don't transmit very much data at a time, so it's the slowest way to connect computers together. Coaxial cable is um, the type of cable that's used for TV. It has conductors and an insulator between the cable wires, um, and it's a little bit faster, so Roadrunner is an example. It's much faster than the old first dial-up connections. Fiber optic cable is um, a cable that's made out of glass and light is transmitted through the glass. 
rather than electric currents as with the metal cables. Fiber optic cable is what they're starting to install across Hawaii now for Hawaiian Tel. They're using it for the Hawaiian Tel TV um, because it's much faster so you can get a lot more data through those cables and that um, allows for you to have like HD TV programming, have lots of stations. So the reason we don't have Hawaiian Tel TV in certain areas on the island is because they haven't run the fiber optic cables yet to all the locations around the island. Um, so that's the fastest wired connection we have available to us right now. Um, and then the last option is wireless, and this is using some sort of infrared or radio signal to transmit data through the air. So if you have a wireless router in your house, which allows you to connect your laptop to the internet, that's an example of a wireless device. Um, and you can connect wirelessly to a variety of different places to get access to a network. Um, if you're within a building like ours and you can connect to the local area wireless, like the LCC wireless, you log in through that, um, that gateway in Starbucks and McDonald's and all those other retailers that allow you to access their internet via their network, you would log in and accept their, um, their terms and conditions. And that's another way to be able to connect to a network is wirelessly. The way that the computers are connected together is called the topology. It's the actual physical layout of the devices and how they're connected via the cables. Um, and once your network is set up, once all the computers are connected together, information is transmitted in packets or kind of like little envelopes of information that are broken down into small units so that they can travel through these cables faster. Um, so data moves through the networks in these packets and then whenever they get to their destination, they get put back together. So attached to a packet is kind of like an address like you would put on the outside of an envelope when you mail it so that when it gets to the destination, it knows where it's supposed to be in correlation to all the other packets that you send. And so most packets have two pieces, a header, which contains the information that tells the network where it's going and what order the packets have to go in, and then the payload, which is the actual data or the actual whatever the information is that you're sending from one computer to the next. There are four different kinds of typology, topologies, which is basically how the computers get connected together. And we're going to go through all of these in one slide at a time. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about each one here. But just remember that the topology talks about physically how the computers are connected from the cable. And one word to kind of pay attention to here is the word terminator. And that's basically where the the connection starts and where it ends. So it's the beginning of the network and the end of the network. And in some cases, the network is, is going to go in a round configuration, as in the ring topology. So you have to kind of pay attention to where the terminator is. Oops. Sorry. Back up. So the bus topology basically arranges everything in one straight line. So you have one computer at the end, and you can connect computer to computer to computer, sort of like the rows of seats on a bus. A star topology has a hub in the center, and all the computers connect to the center. And then a ring topology is everything connected in like a circle. So it's a, a round, rather than a bus topology where it's kind of in a straight line, there is a connection back to the beginning. And then finally, mesh topology kind of just makes one big web where there's a cable from every computer to every other computer, and that's for a variety of different reasons. These are some of the hardware devices you need in order to be able to link computers together. So if you take a look in the picture, the orange boxes are the different connectors. Um, a repeater is a device that prevents packets from getting mixed up when they're traveling. And then a hub allows you to connect multiple devices to a router or a gateway that gets the information out into the internet. And so these computers are connected together via these pink lines, which could be a variety of different network kinds of cables or connections. And then they all get connected out through the router to the, the internet. Here's a picture of how the different computers might be connected 
from server to server. So this is a picture in the center, you see the type B, type A header and payload. This is the gateway. This is where information goes in and out from one network to another. And it's called a bridge. So it connects two local area networks or two parts of a local area network. So if we had a server at the YNI campus, for example, and it connected to the server at the Pearl City campus, that would be the bridge. A switch is a device that allows the information to get transferred to the right place. It's sort of like the old fashioned telephone um, switch operator where they would unplug one and then plug it into another when the person would call the operator and say who they wanted to talk to. It's essentially what the switch does. It takes a look at the different um, headers to figure out where the information is going and then it sends it on the right pathway. A router is a device that stores information that's getting sent out or in to a network. And then the gateway is the connection between different types of networks. So if you are um, connecting from the school to say a website for um, a store, your computer is connecting to the server at your school and then the server is connecting to the server for the business. Those bigger connections are the gateways. So it's kind of like this picture in the middle where servers connect to servers. And if you look in the picture, step one, when you want to send information, say you're sending an email, the packet gets sent through the server and then it gets attached to the header, which is basically you're sending it out and it's giving it a location to where it's going and where it's coming from. So in step two, it's passing through the gateway. And then finally, in step three, your message based upon your address is sent to the correct computer on another person's network. And that's sort of how information gets pushed through all of those different connections. So if you look at steps one, two, three, it starts on the left-hand side through the gateway and then over to the B network. There are certain things that you need to, um, to do or the computers need to do to make sure that the information is sent properly and reaches its destination the way that you had expected it to. So all of these local area networks have protocols, which are basically rules or regulations for how information gets transmitted. Um, so hypertext transfer protocol, for example, is a set of rules that this sort of just for the computer describes what's happening on each website and how the links work. And so in a local area network, there are protocols for how information gets sent partly so that information gets to the right place and also so that when you are sending data, your data doesn't get mixed up with someone else's as it's traveling through all of those wires. Some of the different protocols, um, if you're using an ethernet, which is um, a cable, uh, in our computers in the lab, it's the gray cable that plugs into the back to the system unit. Um, ethernet uses a uh, star topology when you're using either cable or fiber optic wires. Um, if you have a faster connection, um, if you have a fast ethernet connection, um, you can achieve faster speeds is basically um, all that means. And then a gigabit it, ethernet is um, um, even much faster. And so the, the rules for each of these different types of connections are a little different because information is flowing at a faster rate. More information can flow through a gigabit ethernet than your traditional ethernet. So the rules are, are there so that if multiple people are sending data at the same time, it prevents those um, bits and pieces of zeros and ones, which is how data gets sent, from getting mixed up with each other. Some of the different options for how you can connect um, are, are based upon how much data can travel through the different lines at any given time. Um, and there's costs in some cases that differ be, depending upon how fast you want to be able to connect. Um, if you're connected to a telephone line, or even if you're connected via cable, most of the time you need to have a modem. And depending on your internet service provider, you may or may not have to pay for that. Um, example, I have Roadrunner and the modem is is leased, so I didn't have to actually buy or pay for the modem, but as long as I have service, I'll get to use it. When I discontinue my service, I have to return it. Um, broadband access basically refers to any kind of 
transmission connection that's faster than dial-up. So if you have DSL through Hawaiian Tel, or you have Roadrunner, or you have the fiber optic connection, that's considered broadband. And broadband means that you can send more information at any time, so it's faster. Um, if anybody remembers what it was like to have to either download or upload using a phone line, it used to take a really long time to download information or to upload information. Um, and so it made it really difficult to be able to communicate with others just using the traditional phone line. Asynchronous transfer mode is another way to um, send data over a network that's a little bit faster than your telephone line. Um, and it's just a different way of transferring information so that you can send more data at once. If you have a wireless network, um, the speeds can vary because it depends on how quick the network is operating. Wi-Fi is a popular type of um, network connection that you can access from um, different like retail um, locations if you go to Starbucks or McDonald's or, or Walmart or, or Target. Um, and then there's the wireless access point where you can connect more computers, more than one computer to a network. Um, wireless access points require you to have like a router somewhere um, that allows you to connect. So if you're in the building, for example, the school building, you will pick up the LCC wireless because in the building somewhere is a wireless router that's allowing you to connect. Wi-Fi works a little bit differently. We won't get into the real nitty gritty differences, but just know that there are two slightly different types of connections. Um, information systems are basically ways that you can acquire, store, and use data and share it. Um, and there's a variety of different reasons why you would have an information system. In some companies, they actually have a department called the IT or MIS department, the Management Information Systems. There's degree programs that are specifically dedicated to MIS. Um, and it's connected to networks because in order for that information to be useful, normally you have to have a network within your organization where people can share the information. Um, so some of the components of an information system are that you have a physical place to store the data, whether it's a server or hard drives or some place where all the data in your organization is going. Um, and that means that everybody in the organization can also access that data. So most large organizations have, have this. Um, you have to have a means for being able to distribute and share the information. So that means that people in your organization have to have computers that are connected to the data, whether it's laptops or actual physical machines that connect to the server. In order for the information system to be useful, people have to be able to access it. So at LCC, we definitely have information systems in place. All of student records, for example, are stored somewhere. And if you're a student, you can physically connect by using your laptop and logging into MyUH. Teachers can log in and put stuff on Laulima, which allows you to access information. So those are just some practical examples of information systems. Um, you have to, the third component is some kind of procedure for handling information to make sure that it's safe and it's accurate. So whether it means that you have some kind of security set up so that if people who access your network are allowed to update information, you can ensure that it's accurate um, and that people can't compromise the information that you have stored. And then finally, you have to have some kind of rules that are, are um, told to people and then enforced regarding how data can be used and distributed. So for example, at the UH system, there's um, secure websites where you can use, where you input information Access to that data is limited to those people who have clearance, um, and then that data doesn't get distributed without permission, so you can't access anyone else's transcripts, for example. When you log into your, G, um, your UH page, you can access your own transcripts, but you're not allowed to see anyone else's. So the data is limited based upon your username and password. Um, the kinds of information that you can access via the network um, or that are shared on networks. Um, office automation systems. Um, these might be things like time clocks, um, payroll. So there's a, an inventory systems. When you 
use a point of sale systems like Long's does, it mat it doesn't require you to manually take inventory. You can use the computer to log in when supplies get delivered, and then as you sell them and you scan, it gets taken out of inventory. Um, in an office, if you have people signing in or um, using like a, a computer to 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 clock in, then that might automatically keep track of your payroll um, data. And a lot of off-the-shelf, meaning like applications and software you can buy from like an office store, are available for purchase. So one of the examples is QuickBooks. If you have a small business and you don't have the means to hire um, an, an accountant to keep track of your records, that kind of a software program can do a lot of things for you. Um, it automates things like payroll and, and invoices and all of that. Um, some, some, some organizations need to have some kind of transaction processing system um, that pro processes and tra transactions like sales and um, purchases. So when you go to buy something, for example, at Long's, that, compute, that cash register is actually a computer that's tracking what inventory was sold, how much you paid, what kind of, um, whether you paid with cash or credit card, and then it keeps track of the information so that the store knows when to buy more merchandise and also what money was spent and how it's going to then be used in the accounting records. Um, ATM machines also process transactions so it can keep track of how much money you took out of your account and how much money is still there. If you go to the bank and you deposit money, they're using software that's keeping track of that transaction. When you go to the um, when you go online and you buy things from stores, or you, for example, buy a plane ticket, those transactions are stored using some kind of software system. Um, and basically, the the reason why this is important is because networks allow all of this. When you go to the bank your information doesn't just get stored on that individual computer at that teller's desk. That information then gets saved on the server so that anybody that works in the bank has access to that transaction. So if you go to the Waianae branch of Bank of Hawaii and make a deposit, and then you go to the Pearl Ridge branch later on that day, everybody has access to see what happened during that transaction, and um, you're not having to wait for someone to manually update your account information. It gets updated as soon as it goes into the network. So a management information system is basically all the different pieces that are connected together in order to make that information accessible and usable by the organization. Um, some companies actually use the information in order to make decisions. So a decision support system adds another layer into the management information system, which allows the management to be able to take data directly from the computer system that you're using, analyze it, and then make some decisions. So if you're keeping track of sales information, for example, to see whether or not a certain product is, is selling and whether you should take it off the shelves or buy more, you can use the data from your um, inventory system to let you know whether that's a good decision. Um, and then another... Um, a type of a system that's a little bit more unique is an expert system and that is usually software that's designed for a specific purpose and it allows your computer to take the data in the network and perform analysis and, and do some tasks around that information. And expert systems are usually unique to whatever the organization is doing um, and it's probably a little more expensive than something you would buy off the shelf because it depends on what kind of data you need and how that information is going to be analyzed. A computer software developer might then build something that's specifically designed for your organization so that you can use that um, software to analyze your data and to help you make decisions. So these are more sophisticated, more um, specialized types of systems. When your computers are storing all this information, when you have a network and multiple computers are connected to a server, it's really important that that server be secure, first of all, and that it be reliable. So there are some things that companies and other um, types of organizations need to think about when they're purchasing and, and designing their networks. Um, and one of the things that's really important 
is this term mission critical system. Your server, wherever all of this data gets housed and permanently stored, has to be able to run without failure. So without like crashing. Um, and if it has the potential to crash, it should have some sort of way of being able to instantly recover whatever data it was that was stored on that system. So if you think about for a moment, your information with the university, all of the credits you've earned so far, every student's credits and how much money they owe to the university, all that information that's stored when you go into your MyUH account. All of that data is housed on one central computer somewhere. And if, for the, if that computer happened to crash and all of that data is not accessible anymore, it would have a huge impact on all the UH students. It might have a huge impact on the financial office, about people, they might not know who's supposed to be paying what. So if that particular computer was to crash, it would be really, really difficult for the organization to continue to operate normally. So having a mission critical system is important. And there's a, a lot of different ways to set up systems and networks so that if you have one computer that all of a sudden doesn't work, that data is still accessible to anybody connected to the network. Um, and the way that we can create networks like that is by having fault tolerant computers, um, which can continue to operate even when certain components fail. I um, mean, sometimes that means connecting multiple computers together. So they're running the same programs and the same tasks at the same time so that if one of them happens to break, the others are still operating normally. Um, so redundant computers are systems that have multiple hardware doing the same thing at the same time. So it's like having five people doing all the same thing in case one of those five people stops, the other four are still moving. Um, and that's kind of what a redundant computer is. It has multiple components doing the same thing. So if one of those components happen to fail, the others are duplicating what's, what's being done. Um, and a redundant array of independent disks, which is normally um, abbreviated as RAID, is a storage system that links multiple hard drives together so that they operate as a single disk. And that's important because if one of those hard drives fails, um, and we talked before that hard drives can fail sometimes because they are mechanical, they have moving parts. If one of those parts all of a sudden stops, then that might cause it to not work properly. A RAID allows you to have multiple hard disks doing the same thing, just like a redundant computer, doing the same thing so that if one hard drive fails, you still have others that are working. And these are some of the different ways that RAIDs are set up. Um, a striping RAID is basically giving you access to data that's spread over multiple disks. So rather than having all five hard drives, for example, doing the same thing, Hard drive one does part of it, two, three, four, five. They all do a part of the, or store a part of the data so that you can access it really quickly from a little bit from each disk. A mirrored RAID 1 system is when you're having more than one hard drive simultaneously do the same thing. They're storing the same data at the same time. So if one of them fails, the other one is still working. And then the last way is RAID 5, which is called striping with parity. Basically, the data is stored kind of like with RAID 0. Data is shared over multiple hard drives. Um, and the system is, at the same time data is being stored, the system is storing information that lets you or the computer know how to reconstruct the information in case one of them fails. And so you don't necessarily have to memorize all these technical terms, but just know that basically what the RAID allows you to do is have data stored in more than one place so that if you can't get the information from one place you can still get it from another. Um, and then two other terms that are kind of connected to networks. Um, scalability is allowing you to create a network or a computer that you can build up and increase the amount of power and storage that's available. So if you're a small organization setting up a server with a big storage big power is kind of expensive. Um, scaling allows you to do it a little bit at a time. So you start off with one computer, that's your server, and then you can slowly add to it as your organization grows. And the reason why you can add is because of 
interoperability, which is um, a way of allowing computers to talk and work with each other. Um, so it makes them compatible. So there's different types of, of things that are in place so that computers can work together. And when you think about computers that are working with each other across the web on the internet, even though I have a Mac and someone across this country might have a PC and we're both collaborating and sharing information because we're working together, our computers can communicate because of that idea of interoperability. Because although I have one kind of system and the person across the country has a different system, certain things are common to both computer systems that allow us to work together. Um, the data is basically how information gets. Data is the term for information. When we're talking about computers, usually information is called data. Um, data warehousing. If you have a really large organization or if you're working with um, companies on the internet, they have a place, a, a huge data warehouse where information gets stored. Um, and that can be a set of servers. It can be a big, big building where all the information goes. Um, but it allows you to store a lot of information in one place. Um, data mining is a term connected to basically looking through data um, to uncover information. So if if you're trying to find answers or some do some kind of analysis, data mining refers to basically just searching through and sorting out the data so that it's it becomes usable for you to make decisions. And then this idea of data scrubbing is a process that allows you the computer to specify what kind of data you can enter. So for example, if the computer is expecting you to type in numbers and all of a sudden you type words, you might get an error message. And that's a tool the computer is using to make sure that the information that you're putting into it is, is the kind of information that the computer needs. And so that's the idea of data scrubbing. Data transactions are basically sharing of information. Um, sometimes organizations need to send large, large chunks of information, um, and they need a way to do that, which is not email, uh, because sometimes emails are limited, depending on what program you're using to send your email. And if anybody has tried to send large video or picture files, you know that it usually gets bounced back because you're, you're limited to a certain size. Um, an alternative is something called electronic data interchange. Um, and it allows you to put information out onto a server and other people outside using an extranet or at the internet can can access it. Um, Dropbox is one really small way of doing that. It's kind of a small scale type of um, electronic data interchange. Organizations that have large amounts of data that they need to share use a variety of other types of tools, but that's just one example. The last part of chapter seven is talking about some of the ethics related because now this data is out there, these networks are connected. Um, it's, it's not always easy to identify who the author is and who the information belongs to. So there are some things to consider when you're sharing information with others um, that you need to make sure that you're not taking someone else's work or using it incorrectly. And so some of the objectives for this half are that understanding the different laws related to information and sharing the information, and then just some, some manners types of things. Um, two terms related to sharing information. Piracy is when you basically make copies and share things that don't belong to you. So like um, burned DVDs of movies that someone's giving away, those are examples examples of piracy um, sharing files online there used to be a lot of different sites available where you could share music with people those are all different examples of piracy um, forgery kind of takes it one step further where someone makes copies of an original work and then just tries to either sell or give it away as the real thing so that sort of requires you to duplicate the original whether it's an original DVD or an original music file, and sell them to buyers who think that they're real. Intellectual property is all of the information. 
It could be music, ideas, pictures, videos, anything that's created by a person that they created um, on their own and they intend to use it for either commercial or uh, business related purposes. It might not necessarily be that they want to sell it. Um, that's all considered intellectual property. You, when you write a paper, for example, that's your intellectual property. One day you might need that paper to, to uh, start a business. And so you have the rights to that information. You have the rights to those ideas. Um, and there are laws that protect your property. Um, piracy is when somebody steals your property. So if you wrote a paper, for example, and you put it on your teacher's website, and then some student who took that teacher three semesters from now downloads and resubmits your paper, that's considered piracy. Um, it's really hard to to know when people do that because there are so many people that access the internet and these websites every day. It's difficult to be able to trace. Um, but like I said, there are laws to protect you and your property. Um, a couple of those copyright laws are, are um, apply to information online just like they apply to traditional media. If you were to write a book, you would be the author, you would be the one who has the legal right to sell that book. If you put a book online and you don't have it actually printed, you still have um, the legal right to that information. So the copyrights apply online as well as offline. A fair use laws basically um, are a set of regulations that provide circumstances when you can use copyrighted material without getting permission. And so there's a whole bunch of different circumstances where you could use like just a portion of a song or you can use a text if you quote it and you give the author credit. There's a whole bunch of different um, stipulations with fair use laws. But both of these protect the author or the original creator of a work from having somebody steal it and use it as their own. Um, copyrights last for the life of the creator plus 70 years. So as long as you're alive, 70 years after you pass, that information still belongs to you. Anything that's been published before 1923 is not considered copyrighted anymore, even if the owner is still alive. Um, that was part of what was decided when copyright laws went into effect. Um, and then once a copyright expires, then the work becomes public domain. So anybody can use any component of it without having to first get permission or pay the author. Um, so books that were written in like the 1800s, all of those are considered public domain. You should be able to download those for free without having to pay for them. Um, it doesn't mean you can always buy them for cheap, especially if they're like collector items, but you can access the information and you don't have to worry about um, being sued by someone saying that you stole their ideas. Software is also protected. So if you are a software author, you write software, you can get, um, there are protections so that people can't copy it and sell it as their own. When you buy software from a company, you are usually granted what's called a personal software license, which means you and you alone are allowed to put that computer uh, that software on a computer and you're the only one that can do that um, and there are more and more now software companies are creating um, security features so that you can't make copies of software you know when you guys purchased your books for this class you got an, um, a six-month license to use Microsoft Office and once you typed in that code that was on that little card no one else can use it again that's uh, a protection so that that license doesn't get used by more than one person. If you are an organization, you can buy multi-user licenses. Sometimes they're called site licenses, which allow you to put the same software on more than one computer. So all of the computers in our lab, for example, are using um, a site license that grants permission to the university to put that software on more than one computer. Um, an enterprise license is a little more broad. Um, a site license usually specifies how many computers can be using that particular software. An enterprise license just means any computer owned by the organization. So it doesn't really have a number attached to it. As long as it's a business organization related computer, then you can install the software. Um, and software is expensive. So this is a, a big 
a big issue when you're an organization and you need to have computers set up for your employees. If you are making copies illegally of the software, it's also called piracy, just like if you pirate DVDs or music. Um, if you are the one who purchased the software and then you make copies or you allow people to use that code that you got, that's called end user piracy. Um, in some cases, you can make copies and allow people online to access them. That's called internet piracy. And then finally, manufacturer piracy is when you um, are installing com um, software onto the manufacturer's computers without permission. So these are just different terms, re all related to the same thing, unauthorized copies of a software program. Um, and then some of the protections we kind of talked about, like once you use a computer code, no one else can use that same code. Um, but the purpose of these is to prevent people from making illegal copies and the software companies losing money. Um, a dongle is a hardware device that actually is included when you buy the software and it requires you to plug that so hardware in in order to install the software. Um, I haven't actually had experience where I needed that, but um, it's, it may be required for some kinds of software. Um, Software-based copy protection is what we were talking about. You have to have a code when you went to download Microsoft Office. And if you're downloading software online, there's usually protections that prevent you from making copies once you download it, or a lot of times software has with embedded within it security code so that you can't install it on more than one machine. Once you install it on one, it's sort of like that code get used up and you can't go on to another machine and download that same software again. This is kind of how, I don't know if you've ever tried to use iTunes or Google Play Music, it makes it really difficult to move from one computer to another and have access to your music and that's because of the security protections. And so when you use the internet to download and share music, um, there are certain things that you have to consider. Um, there's a protocol that allows um, users to share small parts of a file. Um, it's called the BitTorrent and it's, it, it's just a way to share media um, when you're on a peer-to-peer -peer network, which means that computers are connected directly together, not through a server or through um, a, another gateway. Um, some people don't see the issue with being able to share music because once you buy it and you have it on your machine, um, it's yours. But um, if you're the musician or you're the person who's making the software, then um, most people will, will feel that that's a violation of their rights as the owner of that software. There are some risks when you're sharing information, especially online. Um, there's individuals who attach malicious software to music or video or files that people are sharing online. So if you do go any file sharing sites, it's a lot easier to pick up some of those malicious um, software programs. Spiders and web crawlers are examples of those things. Um, and when you sift through different sites, they inadvertently get stored on your machine and might cause your machine to not work properly. Um, you should always be aware of what kind of personally identifiable information you're putting out there um, because on a lot of those sites you have to give access to certain components of your machine in order to share files um, and that could be potentially dangerous. Um, when you are online sharing information through a network be aware that there are people out there who are specifically waiting for somebody to leave their computer vulnerable. So um, hacking is an issue. Um, there are rules of etiquette online, just like there are in person. So think about how you type information, how you send emails, how you're communicating via a network. There are certain um, things that are considered polite and things that are not. Most organizations have something called an acceptable use policy. The university has one. Most businesses have one that describes what is considered an acceptable use of the online, of the website or the computers that belong to the organization. Um, and that's an important thing to think about because when you use an organization's computer, 
you for the most part don't have a right to privacy because it's not your machine so that's something a lot of people don't realize if you're using your work email same thing you're not guaranteed a right to privacy that information theoretically in most cases belongs to your company um, as a student some things to think about is the internet and these networks um, allow students to share information fairly easily uh, many schools have websites where this is completely acceptable you have um, students going online all the time to do tutoring and share their their notes or their thoughts about certain classes um, and that's good that makes it easier for some students to have access um, there are sites though that support cheating and that you can download papers that other people have written for a fee um, to prevent some of that there are certain schools that require students to submit papers and assignments via sites that check your work um, like turnitin.com kind of scans your paper for plagiarism so these are things that have arisen because of the networks that are that are available to students to be able to share um, and this particular slide refers to the, the work side of it. So as a student, you have to be aware that even though the information out there is, is easy to get to and it's accessible, that you're not being unethical and, and submitting someone else's work as your own. As an employee, you have to consider that you are, when you're at work, using the employer's um, software and hardware and that the computers are provided to you to be able to do work. Um, and so employers do sometimes, again, have protections. I just kind of mentioned this. They might monitor your email. If you're using a work computer, there's software that can track your keystrokes and see what you're doing online so that um, they can track any kind of inappropriate behavior. So some things to consider when you're using work networks. Um, and then when you're sending electronic mail or communicating via um, a chat at work, some things to think about, and this applies to any kind of communication online, but at work it's, it's probably even more important because your job is dependent upon it. Before you send an email or a, an instant message, you might want to think about what you're saying and how it sounds. You reread it yourself and make sure it sounds okay. Um, there's a certain standard of politeness that should fall in every work communication because again it is professional some of the inappropriate kinds of communication um, not sharing unrelated material so like if you find coupons or things that you think your other co-workers might like it's probably not a good idea to send out a mass email um, and if you have complaints about specific things those are probably not things you want to send to a lot of people via email and sometimes it's not even a good idea to send it via email at all. Um, and then the last thing is whistleblowing. In some cases things in a company might get really not so good. Uh, whistleblowing is pointing that out. Um, some of the things to think about with whistleblowing is that it can make, if people know you're the whistleblower, it can make it kind of difficult for you to continue working at an organization um, and that if you do want if you do notice there are unethical or unprofessional things going on that you should keep good records and document it um, and then go through the proper channels to get those information get that particular information taken care of that is chapter seven